right. Good evening, everybody. Um, you can see in the background, we have the star of the show, Nisha, having a, having a good scratch there, and why not? Um, as always, we are your hosts. My name is Daniel Vicanti. Join, join, joining with me is, uh, I always forget your name. What's your, what's your name again? Pratik Singh. Yeah. Uh, welcome to another edition of Drunk Agile. Pratik, you know, it is, it is tradition. You have to tell us what you're drinking first. Um, I also, that's just because Dan broke the tradition of, of straight whiskeys last time and went to an old fashioned. So I decided I'm going to do one of my favorite whiskeys for an old fashioned. That's the Russell Reserve single barrel. Um, it is 110 proof. Um, I, I love this thing. I know Dan doesn't like it as much. It's a little spicier than sweeter. And I know Dan prefers it on, his, on the sweeter side. So yeah. I'm not sure what to say to that. I've got so many things I want to say that, but I think I'm just going to leave that one alone. Um, yeah, so I did, I did break, I did break the tradition and, but blame that. I mean, I don't know when you out there in TV land, I don't know when you're watching this, but this is, it's July, 2020. We're in the middle of the second wave or the tail end of the first wave, depending on how you're, what you're, you're looking at the pandemic. So of course our access to, to good liquor, usually I've, I've made a run to Scotland at least two times during the year to, to replenish my stock and I haven't been able to. So we're quite literally scraping the bottom of the barrel here um, with the stuff. So I actually went with, I guess my better judgment, um, I went with a recommendation from, from Pratik from an earlier episode, uh, the old Forester Prohibition style, uh, 57.5%. Mm -hmm. It's a Kentucky bourbon, of course. Uh, I, I too, because I can't drink any whiskey that is um, spelled with an E. I just cannot, has an e in it. <laughs> I just cannot drink straight. I just can't do it. So I did, I did make myself another old passion. So yeah. cheers, cheers to everybody yeah. out there. Um, hope, hope you have your favorite drink as well. Yeah, one, All right. one, one of these days, whenever we're able to do this in person, we'll hopefully be able to do a little sampling. That's true. At the same time. That's true. Oh yeah, we, we should do drunk. We're going to do drunk agile from Scotland. We're just drunk going to go from this. Go from distillery to distillery and do it. Oh, okay. So I had sold. <laughs> okay. Why are you guys carrying <laughs> mics and laptops? <laughs> <laughs> All right. For, so for tonight's episode, <laughs> meanwhile, back on topic um, for, for tonight's episode, last time we talked about how um, because we talked about you don't know value up front, and so because you don't know value up front, doing any, any type of prioritization based on value will get you into trouble very, very quickly. And in the long run, will actually hurt you rather than help you. Not only hurt you a little bit, but probably hurt you significantly. We talked about some ways to, um, to, to mitigate that, namely, you know, work on smaller stuff, right size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of you out there, I'm sure, probably have the objection, you know, you're, you're saying, well, but... But of course you know value up front. Of course we can know value up front. We can do things like um, usability testing, or we can do things like surveys, or we can do things like, uh, you know, whatever. And, and you know, just, just talking to our customers. Of course our customers are going to tell us what they want, and they're going to be truthful in communicating that to us. So, so of course we have a really, really, really good idea of what value is up front. And so this, this edition of Drunk Agile is going to be starting to, as, as usual, debunk that myth as well that you know all, all these supposedly tried and true methodologies to understand value up front um, really don't help and again probably hurt in the long run so i don't know the, uh, I, I think i would say this and i end up talking the most but i think in, the, in this episode i think pratik will be doing most of the talking so i don't know pratik can you take us away can you kind of kind of lead us down that path yeah there's it's um it's it's based uh, what we're talking about today is based a lot in a few things we've talked about in the past it's um all the stuff from and you you if you've been watching these you've heard these names before richard taylor annie duke danny kahneman all, all, Travesky, all those all those folks it's 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 their work that uh leads us down the path of figuring out hey do people really mean what they say or or are we able to judge value from a completely economical perspective, traditionally economical perspective. And taking it a little further, um, <clears throat> there, there, are, there are a few other folks who have written about this stuff, which talk about, um, there's a great book called Everybody Lies. So 
those those who are those who are listening to look this up um and in everybody lies you you it reaffirms your piece of hey there, there are essentially three main kinds of lies that we tell day to day um one is the lies we tell ourselves and we'll get onto that maybe later second is the lies that everyone around us reaffirms for us and the third is the lies our customers tell us the lies people we interact with tell us and uh that's where this whole concept concept of value starts to fall apart um but your customers can demand or request whichever way your customers talk to you uh, a lot of things saying i really want this um but the that and then when you do design research with them and get feedback can often lead you astray and we'll hopefully talk about a couple of examples of that today and and make the point that feedback as we traditionally understand it um is actually misguided where we're i think i think dan used the term um steam engine era methods yes steam era statistics yes steam era statistics yeah. yeah statistics and i think our our surveys and um the that direct interviews are in my opinion steam era methods of getting feedback we have so we can do so much better right so just just to reiterate i just want i just want to make sure everybody everybody understands we're still talking about kind of the prioritization aspect of things so mm -hmm. we're 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 in the the part of the workflow where we haven't worked on anything yet we're 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 just trying to figure out what to do right it's is before we've done any work it's before we've actually delivered anything tangible to our to our customers we're trying to make a decision all right well okay what 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 should, what should we work on and, yeah. and so that's where things like like the you know focus groups or usability testing or whatever you know prototyping and usability testing all that stuff can come in we can say well you know we can try and gather some of this information from from our customers to help us decide what we're supposed to work on because of course that information is valuable and will help us to be able to calculate um what 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 are those things or help us to be able to prioritize what are those things um that we should work on so so pretty tell me tell me why that <laughs> tell me why that's maybe not the case why why, yeah, why, why course, think, gathering that information up front may may not be all that helpful yeah first i'm glad that we at least level set on the fact that just sitting in a vacuum and deciding it and doing a whole bunch of calculations on your own and figuring it out is is worse than actually going and talking <laughs> to somebody that's just level set on that yeah. um it's it's I, i like to compare it to uh to making new year resolutions but people sit in the vacuum and go these are the things i'm going to do this year and then 2 months later um i'm drinking more bourbon than i was the, the years <laughs> oh before <God. laughs> and as we and we kind of showed showed last time you'd be better off literally be better off just throwing darts to try darts, and decide yeah. what, what you know what what you're going to work on what if, you if, do. You're gonna, if if you're going to do that literally you would be better off rolling dice just just choosing stuff at random okay yeah. okay but yeah so we're not in that world we're in this world where we're legitimately trying to understand so we what we've value pulled, Yeah, we pulled a whole bunch of people in, and we've said, um, "Here is our idea for a new product." Well, let's 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 go down that path to say, "Hey, I have a product right now, successful product, but I am starting to lose market share because another product's come in and it's it's taking market share away from me." And I decide that, "Hey, it may be a great idea is to revamp this product." And let's say I take this new product, bring in a focus group, I, I prototype it, and I put it in front of them. and i go before i go full scale production before i go really hammer this in here here's a focus group tell me tell me what you th think about it now what if what if that focus group comes back with 75% of us go this is excellent this is awesome i love this so much more than your last product and 15% of them go eh that's about the same it's it, i'm not not that different 10% go no really i like the, i like the other product product much better the older product at that point what decision would you make you've got 90% people saying this is the same or much better than the previous one and 10% going yeah not really like it as much as the previous one what decision would you make at that point well of course you'd go with the 10% i mean of course mm -hmm. right yeah yeah i mean yeah, 90 90% i mean 90% does just doesn't exist i mean if you ever had something where you got got 90% back i mean that's that's about as slam dunk as you get right yeah absolutely like anything you put out there especially if if you just just go to youtube and look at the comments 
just look go to any, any look at twitter no there is no way 90% of the people agree and go this is this thing is good and so you'll go with that obviously and this is actually a real case where one of the biggest corporations in the world almost went out of business and had to revert that decision and this 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 literally were the statistics from from when coca cola introduced new coke yeah i they mean went, so I, I believe at the time coke were, were, they were probably the largest beverage producer in the they world were, they were they were they yeah. they had 60% of the market yep and 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 as crowded as that market is they had 60% of it and um they uh, everyone knows the story they rolled out new coke after it was, it was actually if you want to look it up it was called project kansas and they they did this this uh, their their uat or their design sprint whatever you want to call it <laughs> with the uh, with that put the prototype in front of a bunch of people and they loved it and this is the same time when they were getting beaten up on the pepsi challenge because pepsi was doing the the blind taste tests and everyone loved pepsi but then when they saw the brand they actually liked coke so they tried to counter that with hey let's let's Pepsi's taking up market share. Let's let's figure it out. Instead of learning from Pepsi's mistake, right? That, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. When, when blindfolded, we like Pepsi better. But when we actually see something, we'll actually yeah. we'll actually take Coke, right? Yeah. Which, which is which which falls completely in line with what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. which is the actual product gives you real feedback, rather than this you know blind taste test or or this prototype thing. That the real product gives you feedback. So not only was this, not only was this a mistake by using uh, prototype feedback as 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 a slam dunk value thing, it was a reaction to another corporation's mistake of using blind taste tests. Yeah. So that in itself is one example of where it's not that our cust I say our customers lie to us. They do, but they don't know they're lying to us. it's it, it it it's um and it, this this happens all the time this literally happens all the time it's uh, this was a huge example but it happens day to day uh, and i i'm sure everyone watching this teams you've worked on or teams you've managed or teams teams in your organization teams you've coached um have very often worked on this thing that the customer said i really absolutely must have this is so important mm -hmm. and when you actually deliver it they're like yeah I know we said that but it's okay we found a way to get around it yeah i can't i can't tell you so um to give you guys a little bit of background out there um when i when i founded actionable agile um and if you don't know what actionable agile is shame on you because it's the <laughs> best metrics tool on the market it's the best flow based metrics tool out there you know on the market uh, but I know, when Julia i does such a good, Julia does such a good job with it yeah can i i don't know, can i flip people off on that i don't know <laughs> i don't know if we should keep it pg or not i don't know um maybe that's for after uh, but when i was developing when i was developing arbitrage i was i, I was faced with these with these exact mm -hmm. questions and you know the 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 biggest customers i had either either the customers either they were existing customers or they were they were people that i was selling to they would always come to me like an existing customer would say you know hey dan your product's great but in order to really get uptake we we need this particular feature or i'd be selling to a big customer and they'd be like yeah you know dan your product's great but we we just can't buy it unless you have this feature and i can't tell you how many times yep. that we stopped and we um because i'm a terrible product owner probably maybe that's the moral of the story but we stopped what we were doing and we went and we chased these features that are um that our customers were they were literally coming to us and saying dan build this feature and we will buy they were really, they were literally saying that to me you know and and you know this you, you were talking about a non a non insignificant portion of revenue. And so we didn't. I can't tell you how many times that we did that and you know we we developed the feature as quickly as possible we would put it in front of them and there'd be crickets. Crickets. So I mean it's like so I, I mean I think you know not not to believe the the subject but the the cumulative flow diagram is probably the most requested feature in the actionable agile tool because if you're learning kanban if you're learning flow for whatever reason everybody thinks the cumulative flow flow diagram is the end all be all. It is and it isn't. I mean, it really isn't. But when you look at the when we, it, when we look at usage of our tool, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing people ask is, "Do you have a cumulative flow diagram?" But when you go look at actual usage, nobody really uses a cumulative yeah. flow diagram. You know, 
um, the, the features that are our most popular were kind of afterthoughts that no one really thought about. It was just kind of things like, okay, you know what? Yeah, well, that, that sounds like a good idea. We're just going to kind of put it in. And those, those are our most uh, you know, features. So this is not scientific by any stretch of the imagination, but I kind of stumbled into this, you know, kind of, kind of backward because I kept, you know, I kept running into these people and, and they, they were lying to me, right? I, you know, like I said, I don't think they thought they were lying to me, but they were lying to me, which is yeah, why I think it's one of the reasons you and I started talking about this. Yeah, and sim similar to that, like I, I right now act as product owner and developer for an internal tool. And, and almost every day, a, a, a development team member or a manager comes to me and says, I need this in this tool. Otherwise, you know, it's useless to me. It's not useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I dig in a little more to go, okay, what exact problem are you trying to solve? And their problem is something completely different, which I'm already working on because it's, 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 it's not what they, they, it's not what they believe they want. They, what they believe they need. It's something completely different. And that was another thing about what we talked about last time. I could literally throw darts at my feature board and go, that's the next feature I'm working on. And it would end up being more valuable to, to my end users than um, a feature request list from them. Well, so, so let's, I, I, I don't know if it, it's maybe too soon or whatever, but I mean, um... We, 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 let's 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 talk about antidotes to this, right? I yeah. mean, what you know? How do you know? How do we how do we fix this problem? And and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal your thunder a little bit, you know, and talk about your favorite one of your favorite quotes is, you know, the the trick is finding out how wrong you are as quickly as possible. That is yeah. really the trick. You have to go in assuming that you've got it all wrong, mm -hmm. and that the only way that we are going to be able to verify how wrong we are, like you said earlier is to get it, get something tangible, real in the hands of your customers that they are paying for mm -hmm. um, so that they can, you know, vote, vote with their feet or vote with their dollars or vote with their whatever instead of, you know, just paying some lip service. So you, I, you, have, you have an example or some examples of yeah, I have, how I some have companies do that, right? Yeah. Well, so, so what you're really saying, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reinterpret that and say it is, what, what we're really saying is because we cannot determine value, it's hard to maximize our value. What we're trying to do is, in that ROI equation, because we cannot maximize the R, the return, let's minimize the investment to find out if we're moving in the right direction. This is the whole right sizing, small sizing thing that we've talked about before, but we'll, we'll get to that. We'll wait, but you're wait, so you're telling me the denominator is the most important? Because I just, we just talked last time how the numerator is the most important. Just, <laughs> right? No, okay. Yeah, not <laughs> Uh, the, the, there's actually, and even beyond that, even beyond that, what's, what's, what's probably the more important piece is verifying from your customers, are we actually delivering some sort of value? Are we actually solving your problem? And I think that's where the traditional methods fall apart. As we've already said, customers don't always know what they want. Um, and there's a great example of this, which is uh, back in, so, Again, when we're talking about people lying, we have to talk about Facebook. Have to. Uh, yeah, it's the, it, they, they, I think they have the trademark on it now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're, they're, I think Facebook's been around since 2003, I believe. And um, if, if you guys don't remember, and this is another, it, it was kind of like what MySpace used to be, for those who remember MySpace. <laughs> you had to know the address of the person's wall and you would go to their thing on Facebook and you could see what they have posted and their pictures and all that stuff. It wasn't that whole, you, yeah, you could become friends or whatnot, but the way you know Facebook right now didn't exist. You did not go to your home page to get updates on people. You went to their pages to get updates on people. In 2006, Facebook rolled out this, the, what, what, what is now known as the news feed, which did what Facebook does now, which is you go to your home page and everyone that you're connected to, their updates show up in a list. When they rolled it out, there was a huge uproar against this because which which sounds which sounds ludicrous right now because everyone was concerned that this was an invasion of privacy. <laughs> and if you have Facebook, 
and you're not concerned about invasion of privacy, that's a completely different topic. But pe people were really upset. There were, there were hundreds of thousands of people who had created groups saying things like students against newsfeed. And they were, they were the, the, the product designer for Facebook. People were literally sending her emails saying she is the devil. And they were sending Zuckerberg emails it, it was a huge uproar back then because people were saying, why is it that when I haven't given permission to Facebook to show my feed randomly somewhere else, it's being shown somewhere else? Or why, do, why is it that when I log into Facebook now, I feel like I'm spying on people? Um, so th that, was, that, th that was the initial reaction of the users. The users really went, I hate this. They literally came back and said, this is just the most awful thing you could have done. Um, it's just, what's interesting though, the, the counterpoint to this, what's really interesting is just based on that user feedback, you would have gone, we should roll this thing back. This is awful. All my users hate this. This is awful. But yes. stop, stop all investment on it. We're not doing any more development, right? Yeah, I knew that, right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're done. This is awful. Let's, let's pivot. Let's do something else. Right. Let's make the pictures prettier, whatever. Let's, let's do something else. But Zuckerberg didn't do that. The, the Facebook team didn't do that because that is not the feedback they were paying, paying attention to. Uh, they were actually paying attention to page views. And a month after rolling this out, their page views went from 10 billion to 22 billion. Their page views more than doubled in two months. And if, if those are the numbers in front of you and your main way of making money is getting money from advertisers and later selling data to other governments, <laughs> then, uh, you, you would say, I want more pay. I mean, it, people might be telling you they hate it, but they're obviously going and looking at this stuff. They, they obviously want this. So the, the, what, what, most folks do wrong, in my opinion, is they actually listen to their users rather than observe their users. And right. Facebook, whether you hate them or like them, did exactly that. They were observing their users and adapting themselves to it. Right. And, and you know, con context is key here because, again, we're not talking about users in, in a focus group, in, you know, a controlled um, usability test and, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. It's like, it has to be real and out there yeah. in the wild where they're paying for it, the actual thing that they're using because they will lie, right? If it's, if it's up front, it's just kind of this ethereal, non-tangible thing. They're going to lie. That's, I mean, that's, that's the point of this whole talk. It's like only yeah. if you get it out there and, and see, like you said, observe how they're actually using it. That's really the mm -hmm. only way to know. And, and, and the problem with also having what we were talking about earlier is having having determined value up front or having even estimated value up front based on user feedback is you, you essentially, it's, it's anchoring. You get mm -hmm. anchored to that value and you're like, this is what we're working towards. Instead of treating every project, every feature, every story as a bet and as an experiment and saying, hey, this might or might not pay off. We need to find out if it does or doesn't. As opposed mm -hmm. to doing that, you're saying, we know how much this will get us. So we have to march forward and get this thing done. We're married to this thing. Yeah, and that, that's where, I mean, every, everything probably really comes back to poker playing because that's, that's kind of the essence of poker playing is how do you spend as little as possible to get as much information as possible, right? If you can do that, you will win most of the poker games. As you, I mean, every once in a while, luck will come in and that's, it's just luck, right? But, you know, uh, Poker players have this, this concept of bankroll management. And it's like, mm -hmm. how, do, how do I spend as little money as possible to get as most, most information as possible? Uh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's really what it's all about. And so, you know, this kind of brings it back full circle because that's what, that's what we're talking about is what you really want to do is spend a lot, le a lot less time. And this season, it's so counterintuitive. I mean, it, it freaks people out when we say this. I mean, I don't know how many people would be brave enough to do this, but it's exactly what we're saying is, and it's something that we did actually at Actionable Agile, is we spent, we, we spent essentially zero time up front trying to figure out what people wanted. You know? And you know, we, we kind of had a, a little kind of a randomized prioritized, prioritized list. And we just tried to get those things done as quickly as possible to see, um, to see what was working and, and what wasn't working.
that, that, to me, that, that's really kind of the essence of Agile if you really kind of get down to it. Yeah, and, and just, I think, I think the base assumption in all this is, or the base, base tenet for me in all this is knowing that most of the time, 90% of predictions that we make are going to be wrong. So 90% of the time, we're going to be wrong about how valuable this thing is. We're going to be wrong about how much time this thing will take. We're going to be wrong. So every time we do that, every time we do upfront value calculation, regardless of all the time we spent figuring out value upfront, knowing that we'll be wrong helps me understand that all that time is potentially waste. Mm -hmm. All that time we're potentially wasting, as opposed to doing small things and putting them out there uh, and figuring out if, 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 if users are actually doing something with it. All the time spent figuring out value, estimating, even doing extensive user testing, it's, it's waste. Right. And I say extensive user because I think you still need some sort of it. I, I, won't, I won't completely discount it. I will still say that, you know, if you're, you still want to put in front of a couple of people to kind of go, hey, am I going down the right path if you have beta customers? Yep. So, I mean, I, I'm getting, I think we've kind of beat this topic. Um, I mean, I'm getting kind of low on, on my whiskey. So, I mean, just, just to kind of reiterate to, to kind, of, kind of where we came from. Um, basic assumptions that we're saying is, number one, you think you know value, you don't. You think you can find out value, you can't. Right? The only real way, the only medicine that we have, the only mitigating strategy that we've got here is how quickly can we get something in the hands of our customers, something real, something tangible that they have to use, that they have to, use, that they have to pay for, whatever. Um, how quickly can we do that and observe how they're using it uh, so that we can make adjustments to our, you know, our product roadmap or our feature list or our backlog or whatever you want to call it you know, based more on that information, based more on the, on the Facebook story rather than on the new Coke story. So um, I'll give you the last, as always, I'll give you the last word if there's anything you want to say to kind of tie everything up for us tonight. Yeah, no, that's, that, that, that's essentially it. And I think we're, we're as, as people who are invested in Agile, um, we, we should always be focused more towards verifying if something was valuable rather than figuring out if something is going to be valuable. Right. So with that, um, hopefully, <laughs> I, hopefully, I'm sure everybody agrees with this now. You know, this whole, all of these value conversations are, you know, at, at best waste, um, at worst, probably damaging. Um, so with that, I don't know, we'll have to figure out, we'll have to, that, that's kind of, that, that's our, our I was going to say it's our value trilogy, but I'm not sure how many we did on it, <laughs> how many episodes yeah. we did and we did on it. So for next week, we'll, we'll try and come up with something, something new, um, you know, a different topic that we can talk about. Although my guess is we'll, we'll keep coming back to this value thing, you know, all, all the time. So for, for Nisha, who's there in the background, you can see what she two, is two, maybe three legs, two, maybe yeah. three legs and a tail. So for Nisha, uh, for Pratik Singh, uh, my name is Daniel Vacanti. Thank you again for joining us for Drunk Agile tonight. And of course, we will see you in the next episode. Good night, everybody. Good night.